Genesis chapter 35. I'm going to begin reading today with verse number 1, as I did last week as well. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household, to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, change your garments. And let us rise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their foreign gods which they had, and all the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. Verse 7, he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. I pray, God, that it will encourage us, convict us, inspire us. I pray for the divine anointing of your Holy Spirit to rest on the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, I began a series titled, Going Back going back. And at the beginning of that series, I preached that the primal basic instinct of prayer is a need. I have a desperate need in my life, therefore I pray. I want you to remember it was during a time of fear and anxiety that God spoke to Jacob, not just in chapter 35, but also in chapter 32 when Jacob was preparing to meet Esau after years of running from him because he was afraid Esau was going to kill him. And it was during that chaotic time in his life that God and Jacob wrestled and Jacob was transformed. God can speak through your most worrisome troubled, chaotic moments. I mentioned a prayer analogy from Eugene Peterson last week where we often use God as the waiter of the table instead of the companion at the table. We start prayer by talking to him. We end prayer by talking to him, but in reality, it's all only about us. And I asked you this question last week. Have you lost the intimacy of prayer? Have we become faithful patrons but not faithful partners? If so, it's time to call out to God, and it's time to listen to God's voice, and it's time to go back to Bethel. Now today I want to continue part two of this series, Going Back, and I'm going to focus today on verses two through four. I will finish this series next week. Dr. James E. Cossey, in his book, Back to Acts, writes, the Greek word for sanctify, hagazo, means to make holy set apart, dedicate, or purify. The noun sanctification means holiness, separation from profane things. The main ideas in sanctification are separation from what is sinful and consecration to what is righteous and holy. Cossey writes, the earliest Pentecostals were Wesleyan in their understanding of salvation. And Wesley taught that sanctification had its point of origin in regeneration, but it can also be distinguished from regeneration. From the Appalachian Pentecostals to those at Azuzu Street, they heartily embraced sanctification as being subsequent to the new birth. To the new birth. Now, most Pentecostals from the eastern United States had been influenced by the holiness movement. But before they were ever birthed with the gift of the Pentecostal experience, they had long been baptized, uh, or long before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they had been instructed to seek sanctification, to be different, to be consecrated, to be holy. It was a second definite work of grace. Having been taught the manner of sanctification, it was natural for them, once they finally received the Pentecostal gift with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, it was only normal for them to say this, thank God I am saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's an old testimony service from all the people in the old church. Today in our text, we see that Jacob 
has received a call from God to go back to Bethel, to go back to the house of God. He starts out on his journey, but then he realizes you cannot return to a holy place without first getting rid of unholy things. He realizes that in order to be able to fully receive what God has for them, there must be a change. So Jacob asked for all their idols and all their earrings to be turned in. In order for them to fully participate in the blessings of God, they would have to be willing to surrender what they have always seen and held important. Many commentators say that these idols were kind of like good luck charms. They developed a system where they would worship Jehovah God, but they kept an idol on the mantle to give them security and to give them confidence. Jacob ordered that all the households get rid of all their little gods. He didn't want anything to be able to divert the people's spiritual focus. So on this journey of going back, we may start with a real desperate need. And once we hear God calling us back, we must be willing to surrender. You cannot go back to the holy house of God while carrying unholy things. You've got to surrender your good luck charms. You've got to bury them. Anything in your life that's going to take your focus off of God, you've got to make sure you get rid of anything that will cause you to believe God is less than the God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We must be willing to surrender it all. You've got to go through the sanctification process. Lay it down. Everything that used to give us hope, give it up. We lay down every idol that causes us to feel comforted. These, listen, these idols don't have to be the center of our worship, but they still need to be disposed of because if we leave them packed in a suitcase, they will eventually become a distraction and will cause us to divert our attention and our actions from going back to the house of God. You see, too many times in our lives, we've placed God in the center of our lives, but we left our good luck charms in a duffel bag in the back of a closet somewhere. And we worship Jehovah, and we come to church consistently on Sunday. But when trouble comes, when you get weak and you get weary, issues begin to pop up. The problem happens when you can't feel God and you can't see his hand on your life and you don't see the proof that he's with you. Then all of a sudden you remember an old idol in a bag. And instead of remaining true and loyal and faithful to Jesus and his comfort, even though you can't feel him and even though you don't see signs of him, so you, instead of remaining true and loyal, you go and you dig through the closet and you find something that used to make you feel peace. And you find something that reminds you of the happier times of your life. God doesn't want you to have to dig through old bags for memory of a good old day. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to keep marching on to Bethel. God wants you to trust in the seasons of blessings and in your seasons of lack. God wants you to rely on him when you feel like dancing and shouting. And when you're so depressed, you're begging God to let you die in your sleep. It's time for us to get the old idols, the old good luck charms, the old faithful things that brought us peace out of our lives. Bury them. Get rid of them so God can be the only source of joy, peace, and contentment in our lives. God wants us to echo the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, Paul says. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering in need. And here's how I can be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you trust God in all areas of your life, in the good times, in the bad times, in your riches and in your poverty, when you're hungry and when you're full? Have you learned that Jesus is going to be there and you can trust him in every alley, every valley, every mountain? and top, whether you're weak or whether you're strong, sick or well, I can make it through all things through Christ who strengthens me. But listen, this is not a new problem in the lives of the followers of God. It's been going on forever. Stephen, when preaching his last message before he was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, he recapped the issues of the children of Israel. Let me just 
give you a few verses of what he preached beginning at verse 39. He says, Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him, and in their hearts, in their hearts, in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They were still going toward a promise, but in their hearts, they had already gone back. Oh, my Lord, I ain't got time to preach every verse. But some of us are still facing in the right direction, but our hearts are going back to bondage. In our hearts, we're in a duffel bag trying to find an idol to get peace. I got to be nice, Theo's here. And Sister Annette's trying to say, I love this place. I, I want this to be my new home. And, and she's like, oh, he's preaching on sanctification. My first Sunday of a chance of always worshiping with my family. Praise the Lord. They said to Aaron in chapter 40, make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. And at that time, they made a calf. They brought and sacrificed to the idol. They were rejoicing in the work of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is, at, as, as it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it? Now listen to this. You also, look at verse 43. You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of the God of Ramtha, the images which you made with your own hands to worship. God is bringing them out of bondage. And it is so natural for us men and women to take a foreign God with us while God is trying to deliver us. For some reason, we love to hold into our hands something that we have created for ourselves. And for some reason, even while God is making us free, we'll hold on to an item. What are you running to when you can't feel God? What tabernacle are you worshiping in when you can't see God? What have you brought out of your bondage to be a safety net when things go bad? There comes a time in life when we must learn to live by faith and not by sight. We have to learn to trust in adversity and trust in the absence of our feelings. God wants us to bury the idols we trust in and only trust in the God of heaven. If we're really going to go back to the house of God, if we're really going to go back to Bethel, we've got to be willing to change. We must be willing to allow the sanctification process to take place in our lives. We must strive for holiness in the fear of God. Oh, we have a need. We called out to God. God's given us instructions, but we must change. We must surrender what has the potential to one day be a crutch that we will lean on. Listen to what King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. King Solomon wrote, Behold, I have found only this. God made men upright, but they have sought many devices. God has made man upright, but they have sought many devices. What devices are you seeking out? What things in your life are you holding on to? What is your security blanket? What do you return to when you seem lost and things seem to be going out or going nowhere and you've temporarily lost peace and happiness? Is it smoking? Is it alcohol, drink? Is it some dope? Do you have to run to shopping? Maybe you like to go back to the club and get your groove on. Or, or, or maybe you had that safety blanket of pornography or old office flirts you like to call up because they make you feel good about yourself. Maybe you binge food, eat too much ice cream and too much cake. Maybe it's a cabin in the woods that you run to to get away. What are you allowing to bring you peace and contentment other than God and His Spirit? What device are you holding on to? Because it's time to change. It's time for God to sanctify his people. We're being called back to the house of God. I believe God is raising up a remnant that will say, I'm not satisfied where I'm at. I've got to go back to Bethel. Let us get rid of all the little gods we're carrying while the real God is delivering us. Let us get rid of the crutches we're leaning on because God wants us to live according to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your your heart don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight don't be afraid to trust him 
I know it's hard when he's not as visible as he once was. I know it's hard when your mind and your emotions are working against your spirit. But during those times, you remind yourself, I'm going back to Bethel. I'm going back to the house of God. I've called out to God in desperation. God has heard my prayer. God has spoken into my life. God cares enough to come and make sense out of my chaos. God will show up in my darkness. He will be my peace speaker. I'm not going to hold on to things that have the possibility of standing in between me and God. I'm going back to Bethel. I'm going back to Bethel. But now notice this. They did not just surrender their idols. Jacob says, I want your idols and your earrings. Earrings or jewelry is not wrong necessarily. So I, I saw some of y'all trying to slip them off. Y'all were unhooking them big old radars on your face. I mean, you were letting them down. That's not what's bad. The earrings in your ears, not what's bad. In that time, they represented the signs and the culture, signs and the customs and the culture of the day. What they represented was what they had been in. The earrings wasn't bad because they made a man be attracted to your ear. I ain't never looked at an earring going, ooh, that's a pretty ear. I ain't never done it. But what it does is, it reminds me of what it was like when I was in Egypt. And it represents what was. And it represents a culture that had invaded the people. You see, we're trying so hard in today's society to bring as much worldly custom into the house of God. We're bringing so much worldliness into the house of God, we're missing God. We're so influenced by the culture that if we hear a hard penetrating word of conviction we can't hear it without debunking it <clears throat> the culture of the day has always tried to direct the order of the church if you really want to go back to Bethel if you really want to go back to the house of God you've got, got to lay down the influence of the culture and let me say this when it's all you know it's hard to lay it down because what else is there because listen to me, we're in a place now, we've got a generation of church folk that's only lived with the influence of the world in the church. We've got a whole group of people, they don't know any other thing other than culture church. They don't know what's culture and what is holiness. Some way across the ages of time, the church left holiness and went into culture. And then we tried to make holiness look like the culture, and there's no way to have holiness and culture combined. It's like water and oil, they do not mix. And we're trying to raise a group of people trying to look like the world by being holy. The Bible says to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Mm, help me, Lord. So maybe we don't need to say, I'm going to lay down the culture. Maybe we need to do this. God, I don't even know how today's society and culture has invaded me. I've been raised by the ideologies of a modern society. But God, I know this, all I want is you. Therefore, I surrender all the influences of my life. I surrender them to you. God, reveal to me every influence of culture and custom bring them to the surface anything that affects my life and I will bury every influence and culture I will take off every earring and bury them under the tree of Shechem I'm going to keep moving toward Bethel but God I just don't know how the world has invaded my life it's the only life I've ever lived but God I know the Holy Ghost is strong enough to reveal real holiness and I know the Holy Ghost is strong enough to reveal what's culture and what is the word so God I promise if you'll reveal to me I'll bury it at Shechem because I'm going to Bethel we can't go back without change we must allow the sanctification process to take place in our life stop holding on so tight and let the spirit of God do his work in your life look different be a peculiar person 
holy and acceptable. Stop trying to fit into the world when God is trying to call you out. Teenagers, God's trying to call you out. You don't have to fit into their group. God is trying to set you apart. If he doesn't set you apart, he'll never set you up. Ah. Uh, I said, if he doesn't set you apart, he'll never set you up. You'll never be a person of influence until you get sanctified. You'll never be a person of anointed power until you get sanctified. You'll never lay hands on the sick and they recover until you get sanctified. You'll never cast out a devil or speak with an unknown tongue until you get sanctified. Oh, Lord, help me. Because we got a lot of people seeking the Holy Ghost without seeking sanctification. And God is saying, if you want the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you want to speak in tongues, if you want to operate in the fire of God and the power of God, you better bury an earring and bury some jewelry. You better get rid of culture and custom in your life because I'm calling you to a different standard. I know they ain't but two folk that like that kind of preaching. And they over the age of 70. Everybody else is just pure old mad at me. You can always tell the old church of God folk. They'll preach you down shouting with some sanctification. But let me just give you some more proof in the Bible. Look at Psalms 106. Psalms 106. I've probably got too many verses. Oh, I'm looking at the time. Theo, we don't get out to 12, 15. So if you look at your watch, I still got 15 minutes. Right. I didn't. I didn't want you to get nervous going, oh, my Lord, this man's, my girlfriend's daddy is preaching a long time. It ain't time to quit yet. It is cool, though, when you're the pastor, you set what time you quit. You know what I mean? That, that's pretty uh, cool that I set the time at 12, 15 instead of 12. Praise the Lord. That was wisdom. Let's look at Psalms 106, verse 1 through 10. This is a, a, a song of national repentance written by an anonymous psalmster. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his loving kindness is everlasting. I've got that verse right there written in my Bible, in my, in my daily prayer journal. Oh, I give you praise. I give you thanks, oh God. But then he says, who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord? Who can show forth all of his praise? How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times, Verse 4, remember me, O Lord, in your favor towards your people. Visit me with your salvation that I may see the prosperity of your chosen one. I want to rejoice in the gladness of your nation that I may glory with your inheritance. Now look at verse 6. We love to pray verse 1 through 5, but verse 6 says we've sinned just like our fathers. We've committed iniquity. We've behaved wickedly. Verse 7, now listen, we've sinned just like our fathers. Verse 7 says, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindness, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Hey, America. Hey, Rising Fawn Modern Church. We don't understand the wonders of God. We have forgotten the abundant kindness. We've rebelled by the sea. Look at verse 8. Nevertheless, everybody shout, nevertheless. He saved them for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to pause. I ain't got time to teach this. I feel a teacher coming on me. Brittany, listen, nevertheless, I have rebelled. I forgot his works. I forgot how great he was. I, I, I became uh, like my father's. I, I turned to wickedness. Nevertheless, the mercy, the grace of God saved me, not because of me, but for his name's sake, because he wanted to make his power known. Thus, he rebuked the Red Sea. He dried it up. He led them through the depths as they walked through the, through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of the one who hated them. And he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Now look at verse 34. As they came through, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them. Watch this. Look at verse 35. This is where culture tries to invade the church. But they mingled with the nations... And they learn their practices. And they serve their idols, which became a snare to them. And that's where we're at in church. And that's where we're at in America. We have mingled with the culture of the nation, and we've learned the culture of our, and their practices. We serve their idols, and they have become a snare to us. 
Watch this, verse 37, it even gets a little deeper. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. They became unclean in their practices. They played the harlot in their deeds. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his inheritance. Then he gave them into the hand of the nations, and those who hated them ruled over them. The, their enemies oppressed them. They were subdued under the power. Look at verse 43. Many times he would deliver them. Now watch this. Many times he would deliver them, and they, however, were rebellious in their counsel, so they sank down again into iniquity. Let me put it in today's society. And the, many times God would send revival. Many times God would show himself. Many times the glory of God would manifest in the sanctuary. But the people would have rebellious counsel and go right back to their iniquity. Oh, God would send an outpouring on a nation, on a country, on a region, only for us to go right back to our rebellious council and go right back to where we came from. Mm. But look at verse 45, uh, 44 rather. Nevertheless, say it. Nevertheless. He looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. And he remembered his covenant for their sake. He relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. And I love verse 46. And he made them objects of compassion in the presence of their captors. Can I tell you, maybe we've been influenced too much by culture. Maybe we've been too influenced by society. Maybe we're wearing the earrings from Egypt. Maybe our hearts are back in Egypt while we're facing Bethel. But here's one thing I know this morning. If the people of God will lift up a shout and call out to their God, God will hear their cry, hear, hear their cry, he will turn them out of their wickedness and set their feet on a solid God ground. Thank God he still hears the cries of our distress. He will still remember his covenant. Nevertheless, I have sinned, but God has forgiven me. I have broken the covenant. Nevertheless, God has restored the covenant. Thank God there's a nevertheless. Ah. Oh. Save us, they cry in verse 47. Save us, O God. Gather us from the nations. Gather us from the influence of modern society in the church. And that doesn't mean we have to go back to wood cabins with no air and heat. Today we've had the heat on and the air on in one service. Praise Jesus. God ain't asking us to wash it without plumbing. He's asking us to get rid of the earrings that will remind us of what it was like in bondage. He wants us to look forward. It's time to go back. It's time to cry out, save us, oh God. Please save. God, reveal to me things in my life. Remind me of the idols in my duffel bag. Save me, God. I want to go back. I'm going back to Bethel. I'm going back to the house of God. I'm grateful that there's a nevertheless, Elijah, if you'll play some music. I've had hurt. And I've had disappointment. There's been actions in my life that I'm ashamed of. Nevertheless, he hears the cries. Oh, oh, Brother Chris, you don't even know what I did. Nevertheless, if you'll just cry out to him, if you'll just bury those idols and those earrings at Shechem, you can't get into a holy place with unholy things. You've got to get rid of it. For too long we've held on to things we should have let go of. Romans chapter 14 verse 17 says, The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We've got to realize there's some things that aren't going to bring us peace. There's some things that aren't going to bring us joy. That comes from the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he wants us to do. Stand with me. Pretend like there's music. Somebody hum something. It just makes me sound more holy if there's some music playing. Oh, there it is, Elijah. There you go. Thank you. Turn it up so we can hear it. 
God has already allowed you to wrestle. Last week we talked about in this process, you're stuck in a troubled time. Remember all of Jacob's sons killed that whole community, brought shame and disgrace on Jacob. But it was during that horrible misfortune to where God said, you better go back to Bethel. It was when he was worried about meeting Esau and they wrestled all night. And Jacob said, what's your name? He said, quit worrying about what my name is. Tell me what your name is. My name is Jacob. You know, it ain't no more. Because you done wrestled with God. Your name is now Israel. Right in the middle of trouble, transformation takes place. How many of you are ready to go back? How many of you know there's some idols in the duffel bag and you need to get rid of? How many of you know there's some things you're holding on to while you're being delivered? Can you imagine this picture? I'm coming across the dry land. The waters have parted. No mud in the middle. And I'm holding an idol while God is delivering me. Some of you, God is trying to work in you. and You keep holding on to things that will one day keep God from working. So he's called us today to a place of sanctification. He's called us so that we can one day say the same thing that the old saints said. I am saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I want that to be a testimony from children to senior saints. I am saved, sanctified. See, we're trying to go from saved to Holy Ghost. You've got to have sanctification. You've got to allow Him to change your life. I'm going back. This morning, if you want to go back, you got some idols you need to come lay on the altar. You got some vices that you're holding on to. Why don't you come lay them down today? The altars are open. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I'm going to invite you to come right now. Give Jesus your life. If you're not saved, why don't you come first? We're trying to carry unholy things. Ah, yeah. It's a struggle to lay down things you love. But when you bury it and it's